We are so excited to be jumping into this new sermon series, not working, not doing, but living our faith and learning from James. I'm excited for two reasons today um, in particular. One, this is an awesome book of the Bible. Like, it's so great. And I'm going to jump into the intro in a minute. But I am so excited because I am not, if y'all notice, I'm holding the mic. I don't have the wireless headset on. It's not because it's broken. It's because I'm not preaching alone today. Actually, the bulk of the sermon is going to come from our prayer ministry leader, Ryan. Woo! He'll be up here in a minute with the boot on his foot, which is why there's a chair. And um, But I, I want to share with you guys because... Ryan has a tremendous gifting for prayer. He's an intercessor. He um, has a, a prophetic word, like so many gifts. But as he has led the prayer ministry, and he graduated Bible college, and he's done all that, like, so I know he doesn't take the word lightly, but one of the tremendous gifts of seeing him lead prayer ministry over this last several months is coming in on a lot of the Thursday nights and watching him unpack this chunk of scripture passage of scripture for the first 15 or 20 minutes before they pray and watching him rightly divide the word of God, watching him pour himself into the scripture and bring wisdom and truth out of it with godly discernment and feed into, pour into our prayer team before they begin to pray for the church. And so as we were getting ready to start this series, I was like, hey, how would you feel about tag team and a message with me? Because you have an incredible gift for teaching and you do very very much, not just walk in prayer and prophetic, but you you pour a lot into rightly dividing the word of God. And he, I don't think I said it like that. I was probably a little, you know, like not so churchy. Anyway, he was like, yeah, I love James 1. And I was like, well, that's the first sermon. Awesome. Let's go. And so um, so we, we are going to do that today. And we're not so much tag teaming because he came in Thursday night with 10 pages of written notes. <laughs> I was like, all right then. And he's like, I, I haven't, I'm not done. And I was like, well, let's look at what you have. And the more I looked and the more solid it was. And he was like, I mean, I was like, how about I do the intro and outro and you just teach? And he was like, all right then. And so that's kind of what we're going to do. So I want to walk us into this series a little bit as we dig into James. And why do we want to take some time before Easter to jump into James and study what James might have to say? And who is James after all? I mean, we have James and John, the disciples, the apostles, and nope, not that James. We're talking about James, the brother of Jesus. Well, the half-brother of Jesus because they have the same mother, but of course Jesus had a heavenly father. And, uh, and James had, you know, not a heavenly father, and that's okay. So half-brother, younger brother, we know this from Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 55 and 56. I'm just going to read that. So what's happening in Matthew chapter uh, 13 is... Um, Jesus is going around teaching and preaching and working miracles. He's got the disciples, but he goes, he goes to the hometown, and it doesn't go so well. It starts out well. Everybody's amazed, and, and he's doing the miraculous, and they think it's fantastic. And then somebody goes, hey, wait a minute. Isn't this the son of the carpenter? And then they go on. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and aren't all his sisters with us? So we know that Jesus had four half-brothers, and at least two, but probably more, because all is usually more than two, a bunch of sisters, so he came from a big family, and James was probably the oldest of Jesus' younger siblings, because he's listed first, and that's how they did things. So James is the half-brother. Can you imagine growing up with a Messiah? Cool, right? Like, he must have been a follower from the get-go, right? Like, how cool would it be to have a brother that never did anything wrong? <laughs> that was always right? And was actually always right. <laughs> that actually never did a single thing wrong. Would you like a sibling like that? 
Do you remember the story where the whole family was traveling back from Jerusalem and they got two days away? Y'all, it's hot and they're walking and it's dirty and dusty. And they're two days away from the city and Jesus is busy back at the temple teaching and, and, and suddenly the whole clan has to turn around to go back to Jerusalem to find him. Do you think he was really popular with his siblings in that moment? Oh, do you see how holy they're being up in here today, Justin? <laughs> I'm, guess, uh, uh, I'm guessing they weren't that. I'm guessing they weren't that happy. And can you imagine the hushed stories? I mean, Mary still can't go back home to visit some of her family because, oh, really, the Holy Spirit got her pregnant. Some of them still aren't buying it, right? Can you imagine the hushed stories around the family table? Or he got golden frankincense and myrrh at the baby shower. Like, there's a whole lot. It couldn't have been easy for James. That couldn't have been easy big brother shoes to fill. I, I, I don't think James was all that happy. And we actually see this in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus is teaching. It's a little earlier on in his ministry. And, and it says that the family gathers outside in Mark 3, 21. I'm just going to turn over there. Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered. So he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they must have gone running to hear what he was teaching. You think? Huh. It says they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. He's out of his mind. Yeah. Surely once things got started... And Jesus started doing all the miracles, though. Brother James would look back, and the stories that he'd heard his parents tell would start to make sense. Right? Like, two, two and a half years into ministry, the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children, so the feeding of the 20,000, walking on water, healed people, Lazarus is raised, stories start making sense. James is going to change his tune. Don't you think? Hmm. Just one more. John chapter 7. After all this, Jesus went around to Galilee. He didn't want to go to Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. So we're coming to the end where they're plotting his death. And it says, Jesus' brother said to him, now, we could read this in our churchy voice, but I'm going to put on sibling voice, which is apparent from some of the things that come at the end. So I'm just going to start with it, so grant me some liberty here. Jesus' brother said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that you and your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, just go show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. So James enters the world as the half-brother of the Messiah. And as Jesus walks through his ministry, James is the mocking scorning unbeliever. And I can't imagine that that changed at Calvary. I, I can't imagine that as Mother Mary is weeping and crying and her heart is breaking, James isn't referring back to he is out of his mind. And now look at the shame he's brought upon the family and, and look at how he's broken his mother's heart. So, so let me ask, what in the world happened? I know there's 14 women who know what happened. We've been in this James study with Beth Moore digging into it and finding out. It's been really exciting. What happened is that a resurrected Jesus appears to some people. 
Now, that changed a lot of people. It changed Peter and his denial. It, it changed um, Thomas and his doubts. It changed a whole lot for a whole lot of people, right? But, but in that, there's still Brother James. And so, actually, I've got this last passage before Ryan jumps up here and actually jumps into James, which is where we're going to be for the next five or six weeks. This is Paul in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to the Corinthian church. And he's recounting where he's reminding them where all this comes from. And he says, for what I received, I passed on to you. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised up on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter. And then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of our brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then... He appeared. Do we have that slide? First Corinthians. Go on to the next slide for me. Can you read that with me? Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Then he appeared to James. And in that moment, everything changed. In that moment, all that James believed or didn't believe shifted. Now, what's really interesting is, is that we get a lot of the accounts of what transpired when the resurrected Jesus encountered Peter's denial and Thomas's doubts and Mary Magdalene's desperation and all the things. We don't actually know. This is all we get. And Beth Moore paints this really beautiful and touching picture. Um, you know, there's ministry moments and there's family moments. And this one stays private because some things just need to stay between family. Can you imagine the moment between brothers when a resurrected living Savior meets his half-brother and suddenly everything shifts? And so we go from the denying James to James, who actually authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the first book, most scholars believe, of the New Testament. James was authored earlier than any of the other books, authored before any of the other letters. They believe it was written in about 15 AD. And in that moment, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James writes with more of Jesus' voice than any other book in the New Testament. Gee, I wonder why. Because he lived with Jesus his whole life. Parents, that is proof that more is caught than taught. Because even though G James didn't believe the 33 years Jesus was alive, he recounts what Jesus said more than, the three, than all the people who walked with him and believed everything he said for three years. It also means that what we're going to unpack over this next five to six weeks James is to the point. He is blunt. He is candid. He does not waste a word, and he does not mince a word because he got it wrong for 33 years, and he wants to ensure that we do not. He is inviting us to learn some incredible lessons from him so that we don't walk wrong for 33 years, but that we can get it right and actually live Live the faith that Jesus came to give to us. And with that, as Ryan comes up and begins to unpack James chapter 1, I do want to say there's going to be some places he's going to skip. He is not doing anything wrong. James skips around a little bit like Proverbs. So there's a few passages that he's going to not read to you because they really flow into next week and the week after, and we're going to unpack them by subject together. And with that, um, yeah, I am going to read to you James 1.1 1, 1 and turn it over to this very capable teacher of God's word. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nation. Greetings. Well, hello, everyone. 
Um, I want to take us back for a second real quick to when we were in worship. There was a moment, and I don't know if you felt it, where the room shifted. And let's go back to that feeling of, I will trust you, Lord, and you are with me, and I will hear from you. Like, let's engage that faith. As we step into um, this sermon, I just want you to really try and engage what you felt in that moment. That, that mentality, that fight mentality, that like maybe I'm not done. Maybe my story is not yet written fully. Maybe there's more that God has for me. Um, so I'm just going to pray real quick, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so Papa, I come before you, and I thank you for your love. I thank you for your nearness and that you are in this room. Jesus, when you show up, you change and you shift environments and situations. So as we look at your word, God, open our hearts, open our minds, and change the situations. Change how we've read scripture before, God. I even pray that you would change how we look at our lives, God. Give us a fresh perspective of what you are doing and how you are with us through everything. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so James 1 as uh, Jen read, basically says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I was studying this book, I love this book. Um, Sometimes I hate it, sometimes I love it. But uh, when I first started studying this book about seven or eight years ago, um, I had always looked at James as a book about suffering and how to suffer through things. But as I've been studying it this week, God was really changing my perspective from one of how do I suffer well or how do I suffer through things to how do I victoriously live through the trials and the temptations that come my way. So I really hope that uh, as we unpack this, God will speak to your hearts as he spoke to mine throughout the week. So going back to James 1, I don't know if we're there. Yep, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jen really touched on this, but I want to just rework it a little bit that James didn't believe, and now he believes in such a fashion that he says that I am a servant of God. The, the, the word that he uses there is one that has given their rights completely over to their master. So something powerful took place when Jesus and James encountered each other. Um, just a little thing to chew on as we kind of process through what James has to say. So next is, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And so James is writing to a Jewish audience. And um, since Jesus' resurrection, there's been persecution that's come to the body of believers that scattered them around the known world at that time. Um, And the word scattered here in Greek actually is spora, and it means a seed. So basically what he's saying is you are a seed that's been scattered amongst the nations. You have been called by God. Like sometimes the persecution that we face is actually God moving us to the people we're called to. So just a few things to look at in the beginning. And then we get greetings. So now we're going to get into the meat of this whole uh, debacle here. (laughs) So this is where in my story with the Lord, I got a little frustrated when it comes to this first or second verse here, if we want to put that up there. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So if you're like me, you ask, how in the world do we take joy when we face trials of many kinds? That makes no sense to the logical mind. That we want, as humans, we want comfort. We don't want trials. Why would we? So what I want to draw your attention to is the word pure before joy. 
So I'm gonna, I'll define joy first, and then I'll talk about what that word pure means. So the best definition that I found for joy is a state of peace and settled assurance. So what James is saying is consider that you have a settled assurance when you face these trials of many kinds, but he even multiplies that word of joy with the word pure. So that word pure, I want you to think of like a little kid when they're on the playground and they're with a parent, they're running around, that joy that they feel, they're not afraid of anything. They'll jump off the swings, you know, they'll ride, they'll go down the slide. It's this unhindered assurance that someone more powerful than than them has their whole life under control. And so that's what I want us to think of when we think of pure joy. It's not an enjoyment necessarily. It's this assurance that God has it under control. Um, So as we move on, when you face trials of many kinds. So the reality is we're going to face trials and challenges that kind of hit us when we're not ready for them. And sometimes the trial and the challenge seems like it's actually tailor-made to kind of break us in a way. And that frustrated me also. (laughs) But what we need to remember is the next part of that verse that helps us to realize why these trials come. The trials come because they are testing our faith that produces perseverance. And that word perseverance is something you can't get any other way. You cannot get perseverance unless you've been through trial and tribulation. Like, it's a strengthening word. It, it, it's like a bodybuilder word. It, it's like God is, is training our faith. He's training us up, growing us up into something. And so the best word, because sometimes perseverance, it's like we toss it around a lot, but I like to just define things. So the definition that I found for perseverance was heroic endurance, patiently bearing all things, Persistent trust that, yeah, persistent trust. Um, Yeah, so as we persevere, what are we persevering through? We are persevering through the tests that actually have been invited into our lives. Why, Why would a test come? A test comes so that the student and the teacher, well, more so that the student can figure out what they learn because the teacher already knows. But basically, it is a testing that comes, and Job is one that suffered more than any of us. And as we look at Job 23.10, he says, but he knows, and when he says he knows, he's talking about God, the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And this, these tests that we go through, it's to refine away the weaknesses in us. It's to take away the places where our character needs work. And so as we're tested, just remember that you are being transformed into something beautiful, something stronger, something better through what we face. So what could be so valuable to God that he would actually allow trials to come into our lives? Um, One thing that I want us to remember is that our creator, God, he is one that is intentional in everything that he does. He doesn't make a move haphazardly. He's a chess master. There's a move beyond the move beyond the move. So keeping that in mind is very important. I don't know where we are, but back to verse (laughs) 4. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. So as a believer walks through their life, 
and they're, they're persevering. They're saying, all right, one more day. They're walking around the track, and they're, they're praying for a word from the Lord. Um, sometimes we can get to a point where we feel like we're actually about to break. And, yeah, that's a hard place, you know? That's a real place. Like, this is a real text. And God is not, he is not heartless in our walk through the perseverance. He is kind-hearted and gentle. And so when you find yourself in your story of perseverance, and you've come to the end of yourself, that is actually a good place. That's the place where God meets us, is when we've come to the end of ourselves, and we're actually on our knees saying, God, I don't have what it takes to make it the next step. Like, I need you. And then that's where he meets us. So when you're on your knees, that's actually okay. (laughs) It's a good place. So we learn a sense of maturity in that place of brokenness. You can't be fully formed, complete, lacking nothing until you have been brought to that place, and then refilled and refreshed by the Holy Spirit. Like that is what God is driving towards in our lives, is this moment where it shifts from being about me to being about him. And that perseverance is this pressure that is placed upon us so that we learn we don't got it. And he does. So... Yeah. And I just wanted to share a little bit about a trial in my own life. Um, So when I was like 19 or so, uh, I was really athletic, played three sports, and was like deep into bodybuilding, loved it. And started walking with the Lord, and like right when I started walking with the Lord, it was like my health, the bottom fell out. And that created a lot of questions and tension with my walk with the Lord. And through that trial, um, I got really frustrated with God. I didn't understand what he was doing. I'm like, God, here I am, finally living for you, trying to walk in your ways, and why is my life falling apart? in front of my eyes. And I fasted, and I prayed, and I read the scriptures, and I cried, and I got angry with God. Even to the point, because full transparency, like, this was the old identity. This was the old life. This was the old Ryan. And I still wanted it. I got to the point of where I was like, God, I'm ready to walk away from you. I'm done. Like, I can't serve you if you're not going to heal me. Like, what, what's the benefits of following you? But as those really agonizing nights where I couldn't even stand and I was on painkillers and that kind of stuff, um, God taught me how to pray. God taught me what empathy for other people looks like. God taught me what it means to be broken but also able to be used. And it's in our brokenness that our hearts are opened to other people. Before that time, I was a very, like, prideful dude. Like, you couldn't tell me anything. And through this process, I'm still working on it. We're not there yet. But the reality is, is that God has shown me that he is strong. I do not have to be strong in my body. He will be the strength that I need to make it through everything that I walk through. So in our times of trial and testing, there will come times where we feel a great sense of lack. And if we'll move on to verse 5, James says, 
If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is such an encouraging moment in James for me because I find that a lot of times I'm so full of lack, (laughs) and I'm like, Lord, I need you for my next breath. I need the wisdom on how to carry this situation out because I feel like I'm losing my mind. And this is an invitation for asking God, what is the strategy moving forward? I think this is the time in our trial or our persecution where we shift from the moments of why is this happening to me to what do I do with what is ahead? And That's a powerful moment because we're actually taking the grace that God has and putting it into effect. We're putting it into our story as he gives without measure, generously, not finding fault. So there's not a lack in the kingdom of God. This word wisdom is not that you only get wisdom in that situation. If you're lacking energy, ask for it. If you're lacking joy at like anything you can put in there and God will give generously. It might not come in the package that you think it's going to come in, but it's going to come. As we move on to verse six, let's see what James says. But when we ask, when we ask for this wisdom, when we ask for this help, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So, the first word, believe. What is belief? I prayed about this a lot, (laughs) and I like pictures. So, I asked the Lord for a picture, and what he said was, imagine, and it's funny because our church is called Bridge, but He said that belief is like a bridge to heaven, and we place our foundations on him. So imagine in your mind that as you believe in the Lord, you've created this bridge where resources can come from the throne to your heart, and it's just a highway where both you and the Lord are communicating and talking to each other. Resources are coming. Life is being built because of this bridge. So what happens when we let doubt come in? And why does James say, do not doubt? Doubt, he says, is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So doubt comes in to the foundations of your bridge, and it starts to wear away the foundations that are rooted in the solid rock. And as we let doubt come in, the bridge is not as stable. It cannot handle the same amount of resources. It can't handle the same amount of transportation. So the reason that we can't let doubt in is because it wears away at exactly what God wants to give us. So do not let doubt creep in when you pray. Believe. And trust, and this is, this is a hard battle. And that's what I want you to realize is that what God's been teaching me is that we have to verbally and with authority battle the doubts in our mind. It's not sit there and pray it away. No, like I declare in the name of Jesus that he will come through for me. Like, I am healed. Come on. (laughs) Let's go. But it's real. Like, our words have power. And the enemy knows what words have power. So he'll speak them over you. So why not reclaim the power that we have as sons and daughters to create with our words the truth that I believe in my Savior, and he will come through for me. Do not let doubt creep in and steal from you because it is a thief. Now, speaking of the resources that we get from the Lord, 
Let's move on to verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So James loves to jump all over the place and then get right back on topic. So blessed, that word blessed is connecting us right back to verse 2 about the joy and the pure joy that we find when we face trials of many kinds. So how are we blessed? We're blessed with getting to know the Lord as our Savior in a way that we never would have before as we persevere under these trials. So in verse 2, James says, count it all joy when you face trials. So imagine you're facing this trial. It's, it's, it's on the road that's leading, we'll just say it's on your, your bridge, and it's blocking the traffic. So you have to face it in the beginning. Verse 12 He says, you've persevered under the trial, which means that you've actually attacked this giant, attacked this trial, whatever challenge it is, and you've actually defeated it, and now you're learning how to carry that trial. You aren't just wimping out and running away. You are becoming strong enough through the power of the Holy Spirit, to get under it and walk. Come on. (laughs) I'm getting a little emotional, so if I cry a little bit, that's all right. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, But yes, these tests are not to crush us, but they are to make us into the men and women of God that we were created to be. As we progress and walk through them, there's a promise that we will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And this is an honor bestowed upon the victorious. And that is what I want to tell you today is that I've read this from a victim mentality for eight years. And the shift is that this is about being a victor. Like we are victorious in the name of Jesus. Like you might, you might not even feel it or see the ramifications or the fruits of what you are saying yes to the Lord and not turning away for, but in the spirit and in the reality of eternity, you could be breaking curses and things off your bloodline that nobody else believed that they could break. Maybe this is a, maybe you're the first person that broke alcoholism in your life, in your family line, and you are creating a new path for those who are walking behind you. As you say yes to the Lord, you are trudging a new trail. That's why it feels awful. That's why it hurts. But believe you me, that Everyone that walks behind you will have an easier part in that journey because you said yes. And as we say yes, we receive this crown of life. But when we say yes to the Lord and we say, you are more worthy of this pain and this trial than the comfort I could get outside of you, that is the most loving thing you can say to your Savior. The goal of our faith is that we would know him and be like him. Jesus suffered upon the cross, and we as believers learn to walk the route of suffering, and we get to know who he is through that route, but you don't stay in suffering. You walk into joy, and as you walk into joy and perseverance, you can then Comfort others with the comfort that you've, reser- you've received from that situation. There's nothing like meeting when you're in the midst of a hardship, meeting someone who has been victorious on the other end, telling you, you can make it through this. 
I know you can because I have. And the Lord did this for me. It makes that person that's in the midst of that fire say, all right, one more round, Lord. One more round. Yeah. So all of that is amazing. But I do want to say a side note. There's two paths when we walk this path of perseverance. The two paths are either we persist and we keep going and we reach the goal of our faith, or we take a detour down the path of bitterness. And this is a path I've walked, (laughs) and it is a brutal path. It's a path that will make you question if you even believed in the first place. And it is the bait and the root of Satan's ability to move you to places you shouldn't ever be. And so I just wanted to bring that out that if you find your, uh, going back to verse five, if you find yourself bitter, ask the Lord to remove that bitter root. And it's okay to be angry with the Lord. I want to put that out there. There's some things that feel unfair, but if you, if you just push it aside and keep walking, and you're like, all right, I'm good, it drives a wedge between you and God. Do not let uncomfortable feelings keep you from that personal relationship that you need with Jesus. Bring your anger, your frustration, whatever it is to him, he can handle it. I spent four years angry. If I showed you all my journals, it would be embarrassing. Four years of just, I'm still walking with the Lord, but I'm angry at you. But he was patient and faithful through every one of those years. And his work didn't stop. He kept me going, but it was hard. But I'm glad to say (laughs) that we're on the other end of bitterness now. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But I bring that up to not as like, not as like I'm all good and I did it. I bring that up to tell you that was four long years of nothing, no praise, no thankfulness, just anger. And he handled it all like a true gentleman and I get to preach a sermon about it now. (laughs) When we are weak, he is strong. Thank you, Jesus. So we'll move into verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So trials and temptations in in the Greek that James used here, they're very similar root words. So what that means, when we go through trials, the temptation is like standing right next to the trial And it is inviting and enticing us to go away from the course that God has planned for us. So realize that. Know that there is temptation that is to follow your tribulation. But we don't have to take the bait. Don't take the bait, baby. (laughs) So going back to that verse about God is not tempting me, or is not tempting. Um, I think we'd all agree that God doesn't tempt us. If you've been in church long enough, you'd say that. But how many times have we made a poor decision and then blame God for the consequences afterwards? And I think that that's more of what James is kind of driving towards here, is that who are we blaming for the temptation that we've bid on? And James goes on to say, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And this is a a reality that I want you to 
take to heart. So we've been taught a long time that Satan creates temptation. I'm here to tell you today that Satan doesn't create temptation. It's actually the sin nature that is inside of us. Just like um, James says, it's the evil desires that we let stay in our hearts that allow Satan to tempt us. He studies you and he knows your movements. He knows what you like, what you don't like, what gets you excited, what doesn't. And he studies that And then he brings the temptation that is crafted for you. And now he puts it in front of us and we flirt with it and we think about it and then we bite. And when we bite, we might nibble a little bit and it might not be that bad. But then after we've eaten our fill, that sin becomes death. It's a spiritual death. It's a fixed habit. It's something that you started that you're like, nah, I'm good. I'm only doing it once a week. It's, it's whatever. And then the next week, it's every other day. And then three, four months down the line, you can't live without it. You're trapped. So this is sobering reality. I just want to, James is very like, this can happen. But we'll, we'll bring the atmosphere, we'll bring the atmosphere back up. But think, think on it for a second. I do have a story about this situation that I read one time. So there's this beautiful bird. He has immaculate feathers of colors of all kinds. He's flying high in the sky, full of identity, full of peace, full of everything that God created him to be. As he's flying by, he sees a man pushing a cart. As the man pushes the cart, the shiny objects catch this bird's eye. So he's up there. He leaves his natural reality, which is the sky, to go down to the ground to meet with this vendor. So he goes up to the vendor, and he says, hey, what's what's in your cart? Uh, Trinkets of many kinds. They're beautiful. They'll bring you everything your hearts desire. Okay, what's the cost? One feather, just one feather. So the bird says, I have a bunch of feathers. What's one going to hurt? Plucks the feather, gives it to the man. Next day, takes off on flight, sees the man again. Thinks to himself, man, that trinket yesterday really made me feel good about myself. Let me go back. This carries on for a few months. One day, steps out, goes to take off in flight, and he can't fly. And he's like, hold on. Where'd my feathers go? What have I done? So he comes broken, walking, not his natural tendency at all. He's out of character, walking back to the source that has taken from him what was his freedom. And he goes to this man and he says, what can I do to get my feathers back? And the man says, you've received your reward. Every trinket that you have is your reward. And so the bird walks away, hurting and broken. And that's a hard reality of where temptation leads us. It leads us to a death away from our created design. But, God, (laughs) come on, Jesus. Let's go. There is always hope in our Savior. So, 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The hope in the midst of all of the trials and the temptations and the tribulations is this. We don't have to be deceived and lied to about our father. There's two fathers in this world. There is Satan, the father of darkness, and there is Jesus, 
or God the Father. And there's a huge difference between the two. One comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he, he coats it in a candy coating so it goes down smooth. The other comes to bring life and life to the full, but he doesn't sugarcoat what the reality of what you're getting is. Never one time did he hide what the reality of the cost of our salvation is. Jesus paid a high price for our lives. It was not easy to stay on the cross. He chose to go through the agony of that situation for the joy set before him. And what did James say in the beginning? Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds. How do we walk through what we go through? We look towards our Savior. What did he do? He looked towards you and he looked towards me as the prize for his suffering. And guess what? He is the prize of our suffering. You get to know him at a level you never would have before until you hit that point. And we're crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives through me. If you believe, that's the reality. So, God offers us a new birth, as James says, into life and the word who is Jesus Christ. Not a natural birth. We've all done that. But a spiritual birth. God's desire has always been for you to know what you were created to be and to be his family. We are the sons and daughters of God for those who believe. In Romans, it talks about how the, the world is actually like crying out for the sons and daughters to rise to what they were created to be, to rule and to reign. And that is what God is birthing in us as we walk through the maturity process of perseverance. It is the ability to rule and to reign with humility so that you don't walk and feel like you're better than others, but with every resource that you have, you lay it down at the feet of those who need it, just like our Savior. So if you haven't had that opportunity, God is always looking to show you that you are the apple of his eye. He doesn't test us to hurt us, but to train us in righteousness and allow us to share and Jesus Christ suffering so that we would know Jesus deeper and closer. The invitation has always been, God created you in his image. Now will you let him transform you into that image? Yeah, so I'll pray and then we're gonna let Pastor Jen come up. So Father, we love you. We thank you. I thank you for your presence that silences the darkness that leads us through the pain. And I pray that every single heart in this room that has been wounded, where their soul has been captured, Lord Jesus, that you would come and bring inner healing, that you would lift us to new heights, and that, Lord Jesus, that we would walk in faith and truth for what you have in store. I, I pray that you would paint heaven on our eyelids, God, that we would see the beauty that is ahead, the joy that is ahead, and that we would shift from being victims who are beaten and broken to a victorious church that walks in authority and victory, Lord that as in heaven, it would be made here on earth, God. Please start with Bridge Church. Start with me. Start with this place, God. Whatever stands in the way, King David said, search me for any wickedness that is in me. So we come before <laughs> you, the refiner, and we say, refine me, Lord. Bring out the gold that you see so that then... I can help others 
with the comfort and the gold that you've brought out of me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give a little hug. There is nothing for me to close with. Well done. Well done. Um, I am just excited to continue to unpack. This is a rich, rich book full of so many lessons for us. And uh, we were going to unpack a few more passages in that, but there is no need because God is good. And as we continue to allow the word to work and pursue that crown of life,